just let me now just walk through um, through the first part of this presentation. This should take about half an hour. Uh, and and even though I'm I'm saying that I'll focus on the hardware, I'll focus on the hardware and the chip components and the and the architecture behind it. Uh, but as you will see, a lot of um, uh, Samanova architecture in general is driven by software. So you'll get to see a lot of that from the rest of the, the presentations today and tomorrow. Okay, So uh, let me go through the standard uh, safe harbor statements. Uh, and I'll talk about the, uh, the core technology stack today. Uh, I'll talk about SN30, which is our uh, RDU as well as our system. I'll talk about the details. Uh, I'll tell you what RDU means, uh, and and then we'll talk about data flow architecture. So that's the key underlying uh, principle behind a lot of our architecture, both on the hardware and software side. So uh, just to talk about what exactly does Samanova do? So Samanova, uh, at, at Samanova, we make our own chips, AI chips, as you will see. Uh, we put them in systems. So that's the hardware part of this that you see at the bottom of the stack. All of this is driven by software. Um, and software can mean, um, at, at, at a very core level, it can mean things like compiler and runtime and analyzer, things like that. But we also do other things. And you'll, you'll hear about this during the meeting, uh, during this uh, presentation today and tomorrow as well. That is, we, we actually do... Uh, uh, about the, the the system stack, so to speak, where we uh, do models uh, that are pre-trained and we deliver pre-trained models as a service as well. All of that is managed through a platform management layer. Uh, we uh, you can think of this as as Kubernetes or you know some um, version of that. Uh, so print uh, uh, at least in in principle, it it sounds like that. Uh, it it it's that way. Uh, foundation models about that, uh, as I mentioned, we deliver uh, LLM and uh, vision foundation models uh, as a service. So um, uh, these are pre-trained, these are pre-compiled, these are pre-optimized, uh, they are pre-trained on, on uh, uh, various uh, data sets that are out there, uh, domain-specific data sets as well. And then in some cases, we provide solutions, although we also leverage partners for these solutions. So that's the overall stack that we have. Uh, we don't do everything, but we do a fair bit of it, and and certainly more than uh, most of the vendors that you'll see out there in the feed. Okay, so um, that that's the idea behind uh, the Samanova architecture. So as I mentioned, there are two um, uh, in this platform or in this architecture. We have two offerings. One is the data scale offering, which is I think Morley talked about that. Um, uh, the data scale is is our rack level deployment. And we'll talk about that primarily in this in this top uh, in in my thirty minutes of presentation, and then there is a Samanova suite, which is the the stack above that that you saw, right, with the LLMs and pre-trained models and things like that. So uh, we can get into each of those details uh, throughout the next six hours or so that that today and tomorrow that we are talking about this. Um, the fundamental behind all of this is AI is transforming the way software is written, right? Um, the the old style of you you have to have your your um, code be explicitly programmed for every rule and every uh, condition that you can think of. That's all well in the past, and and that still works for a lot of the systems design C C plus plus type uh, applications, right? So the databases or ERMs, uh, ERP CRM kind of applications. Here in in AI, and AI has fundamentally changed the way people think about software. And here, uh, models are the new code in in that sense. That is, uh, what enables all of uh, uh, AI to go get to the point where it is, is there's a tremendous amount of compute that is now a commodity. So this is like universally available things that you can do today, you could not do 30 years back, right? Because fundamentally people didn't have access to that level of compute. But the, there are two other things that, that are actually the, at the basis of this. One is when you're developing these models, uh, memory capacity is a huge, huge pain point. We'll see that as we go along. And then the fundamental idea behind the behind these models is a data flow uh, notion. That is, they're all written in data flow style. This is a different style of programming than your state-of-the-art architectures that are there, uh, the state-of-the-art uh, applications that are there. And the state-of-the-art architectures today, whether it's CPU or GPU, are not geared for this. So you essentially need a new platform, a new uh, architecture that is better balanced for this kind of AI um, training or AI uh, inference models that that we see here. Okay, so fundamentally, that's the that's the sort of principle behind why you need a different architecture, why you need something that the uh, why the current architectures don't get you what you want. 
Now, it's not that they don't entirely get you. There are ways of force-fitting uh, models, and, and people do that all the time. Um, the old way of, you know, if you have a, a model of like the simple one shown here, a convolutional network shown here, uh, is it, the, the standard way in which this operates is what you see on the left-hand side of this, which is you take each of these operations like a convolution pool uh, followed by another convolution followed by a norm followed by some, and you kind of set this up in a pipeline one after another. That is, you dispatch the convolution operation, you dispatch all, all its inputs and all its weights and parameters, send it off to a CPU or a GPU, it does its thing, comes back, uh, and, and it and its results, again, need to be saved in memory. And then you repeat the same process. So it's a sequential process where there's a lot of memory overhead, a lot of memory uh, data back and forth between the memory subsystem and uh, the execution unit. Uh, there is also a lot of host overhead because the kernel takes a trap every single time, right? And then there's the overhead of doing all of that. What we fundamentally changed is that we've changed things from there to where you see on the right-hand side where you now have a, a different uh, paradigm for how you are going to compile these models, how you are going to run these models. And that essentially is at the basis of the, of the architecture that we will talk about, okay? So that's the change. All of this is based on um, uh, a couple of notions there. That is, how much compute do you need? How much memory do you need? And clearly in the case of AI applications, we know we need a lot more memory because a lot, there's a lot more data than there is in traditional applications. So, you know, how much memory do you need and, and how, you know, what are the communication patterns between these various uh, units? So if you look at, at, at frameworks like PyTorch, for example, other frameworks are similar, right? They have like 125 to 150 kinds of, of operations there. So I've, I've kind of taken two examples here, softmax and, and layer norm. Uh, you can see the, the uh, equations that represent them. But more, more interestingly, when you look at the various components of that, right? softmax basically consists of express, um, uh, the, the exp uh, operator, the exponent operator, the sum and, and the division operators, right? So those are the operators that are, that are involved in that. Similarly with layer norm, you'll see, you know, there's, there's a mean operator, there's, there's a sub traction, there's, uh, you know, things like that. You can see it uh, down here. The point of all of this is when you take 125 or 150 of those operators, you can take that and you can break it down into some common elements that are there. And each of those common elements underneath that, they have a certain notion of how data is passed, what's the locality of the data, and the amount of parallelism. Now, all of these are inherently, embarrassingly parallel uh, operations, right? So how do, you, how do you exploit those, right? How do you schedule these in, in time and space? That's basically... Uh, what we try and capture within data flow itself, right? So that's the idea behind it. Um, how do we do this? So what we've done is uh, we have instantiated this in um, uh, in real life on a chip. Uh, so we call it the, the Cardinal SN30 chip. Uh, uh, what we call this is, uh, a, is um, a reconfigurable data flow unit. That's what you will see throughout these presentations. When you see something like an RDU, that's basically what it is. And we'll talk through the next couple of slides on what each of those terms actually means. What's a reconfigurable? Why is it a data flow, right? So um, those are very key concepts behind why this uh, chip is produced the way it is. Uh, manufactured with state-of-the-art seven nanometer technology, lots of transistors, as you might be, uh, as as you might uh, believe. Uh, there's a lot of memory on the chip, right? There's uh, and we need that in order to make sure that you are not going off the chip frequently, because as you saw in the previous slide, that was a key behind how the new paradigm would work. Is you can't be doing this back and forth between memory uh, subs subsystem and the uh, and the execution unit all the time. And of course, you need a lot. So so you need a lot of memory, but you also need a lot of compute. Okay, and then all of these, because the AI problems tend to be very large, you need a way of connecting all these chips in, in a way that are, that's super efficient. So uh, there's a lot of that going on as well. There's this mystery around 100 kilometers of wire that we'll get to in, in, in a minute uh, when we understand the, hist uh, the, the architectural details here. Um, so underneath the SN30 chip, right? Uh, uh, what what we have is essentially it's a tiled architecture. The um, re, um, reconfigurable data uh, flow unit, or I'll call it RDU from here on, um, is broken up into eight tiles. Each of these tiles essentially can work uh, either independently if you want them to, 
or they can work together. That is, you can combine these styles in many different ways. You can combine them horizontally uh, together. You can combine them vertically together, or you can combine all eight of them if you want, right? But they can also work independently, which means you can run different applications at the same time. So we'll, we'll get to that multi-tenancy and, and all of that a little later as well. Uh, but that's the idea behind it. Um, all of this is connected on the system. Uh, so there's, there's DDR memory on uh, that's attached to each of these um, units here. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit about that as well. And then there's the whole scale out that happens with each one of them. That is, how do you connect it to the IO subsystem that's out uh, through the IO subsystem to the other units that are out there, right? So um, that's also an interesting problem because very often you need uh, a tremendous amount of throughput or and, and very low latency to be able to enable some of these models to work at, at full speed. So uh, that's the idea behind it. You take one of these, you know, there are eight tiles on, on an SM30. Each of these tiles essentially is a collection of what you see on the right hand side here. So each of these tiles has these various units um, that we call PCUs and PMUs and, and switches and um, address generators and coalescing units. So that's the combination that you see. So you see a matrix of these. What this means is there's a large number of compute units that are out there on the chip itself. Per tile, there's a large number of these. Um, there's, there's in fact something like 160 per, per tile there. Similarly, you have a large amount of memory uh, units out there as well. And these hold the weights and, the para and parameters. They'll hold the inputs for each of those operators uh, that feed in, uh, into the PCU, as well as um, they will hold the, the results, the, the output of, of each of these operations as well. Um, the, the S's that you see are essentially switches. The, this is the switching fabric that is used to move data from uh, the memory units to the compute units. And it's a kind of, as you can see, it's a very intricate connection, which is where the 100 kilometers of wire actually comes in. Because here the idea is to make data available from any of these units to any of the compute units that you need at the fastest and with the lowest latency that you want, right? Now, remember on the chip itself, the latency is very, very low. The throughput's very high. It's of the order of 150 terabytes per second. But so what that means is data is, it's, it's, uh, you can treat data as, as being there with virtually zero latency as long as it stays on the chip, right? That's the key. And then moving that data around uh, at that low latency is the job of the switch. So the switch is, is used to generate that, also provide the various kinds of mappings that you need. So we'll get to that as well in a second. So that those are the components. Just going through each one of them a little bit, one by one, um, the compute unit is essentially the workhorse. Uh, we call this a pattern compute unit because as you saw in one of the previous slides, um, each of the operators is broken down into small, smaller number of units there, smaller number of uh, operations there. Each of those operations we call a pattern, right? So that's the historical thing behind this. We call this a pattern compute unit. Essentially, it's the unit that can execute each one of those patterns, right? And by patterns, we mean things like norm and sum and, and things like that, right? That you saw in the each of the operators that you saw previously. Um, so the PCU itself is a collection of, um, um, it's, it's um, a multi-staged pipelines uh, set of uh, ALUs. So these each of the ALUs is basically a, a SIMD execution unit, and these are organized into lanes. Right? The architecture of the PCU matches the data flow of, of many of these patterns themselves or of these operations themselves. Uh, in each one of these that you see, uh, in each uh, ALU, as well as across ALU, you get a certain amount of parallelism across the lanes. And then this pipeline parallelism that happens across the various stages, right? So the whole uh, idea of this uh, flow of operations, so there's, there's a fairly large number of units here. The units can be uh, pi both pipelined as well as uh, stage-wise run in parallel as well, okay? All of this is uh, run uh, without, so running these things at, at speed and at this volume or you know at this uh, stage um, essentially means that you have to remove certain bot bottlenecks. One of the things in, in here that we do is there is no instruction decoding that happens in this, right? So um, we, we will see this a little later as we talk through the uh, PCUs themselves are there is no instruction set, uh, there's no fixed instruction set architecture. There are certain instructions that are formed that are part of the, uh, uh, and, and certain data types that are part of the uh, operations that it accepts. But 
each of these PCUs essentially gets programmed every time uh, you compile an application, right? So that's what, so each of these then uh, gets executed that way. There is no speculative um, uh, execution either like you see on, on a CPU or something like that. So it's not like uh, you have to roll back anything. These are just fairly straightforward. You just go through this pipeline, go through the stages and just get to the answer kind of uh, units, right? So they, they need to operate very fast because of that. The way to feed them essentially is uh, uh, is achieved by the pattern memory units, right? So the memory units themselves uh, distribute the on-chip memory through, uh, throughout that um, uh, RDU itself. Their function is to minimize off-chip memory access and to place the input and output data right next to the PCU itself so that, so that there's the lowest possible latency there and highest possible utilization, right? So that's the idea. It supports data, um, data flow parallelism. It also supports model parallelism in different ways. Um, the PC, PMUs, the memory units themselves, are can the memory can uh, the data can be moved from any memory unit to any other memory unit. So it's there isn't a one-to-one -one correlation between an, uh, a memory unit and a compute unit. Even though you might it might look like that in the matrix that you saw, but you can you can have different mappings. You can have one on one map, one to one mapping. You can have one to many. You can have many to one. You know, all of those mappings are possible. You can do uh, broadcast in subgroups. You can do you know many to many broadcasts. All of that is possible, and that is all done with the switch, as we'll see. But within this, there is also an address ALU. So there is an address uh, generation unit as well. So essentially the compute unit is is freed from having to do things like uh, address generation right so that operation is also uh, done within the pmu itself right so this allows for a large amount of data to be brought in at very high throughput and very low latency um, because of that all of this is enabled uh, through the switching fabric so when when you look at the switching fabric this is a, a high speed switching fabric that connects the pcus and pmus and it's got like three types of networks. It's got scalar, it's got vector, and it's got control networks. We, do, we don't need to get into the details of that, but the switches are pipeline and they allow for data flow that is seen in all of these uh, various patterns. So if you are looking at one-to-one -one or, or one-to-many, right? Like you saw in, in the previous, and you, you will see that in an example coming up as well uh, uh, here. Um, so all of that you can uh, get through the switches themselves. Similarly, the uh, AG and CU, the address generation and coalescing units, this is our interface to the IO subsystem itself. So uh, this is how the PCUs and PMUs and the switches will uh, talk to the rest of the system uh, outside of this tile and outside of this chip as well. Okay, so both ways. Uh, again, here uh, within this uh, subsystem, you, you also have the address ALUs. Uh, the idea again being that all of that job should not be left to the compute unit. Each of these units independently conf um, configures that or uh, in independently does the calculations so that you can um, get uh, you can get arbitrarily complex accesses that you want, right? Um, uh, as long as um, uh, you have dedicated ALUs, you can do this at at much faster speed. So that that's the idea behind it. Um, all of this is. Uh, essentially run through uh, by a software architecture that we call Samba flow. You will see many details of this in the next presentation, but what I wanted to show you here is, um, a, uh, here's how the flow works. You have an application, let's say it's in PyTorch, right? Uh, other frameworks and other ways of doing it are also similar, okay? So you have, you have an application in PyTorch, that application, uh, is is reduced to a graph so there's a there's a certain kind of uh, graph that is drawn of it and then it's translated into a pytorch so uh, as in, into a samba pytorch um, uh, graph itself right so samba is has got its own structure it's very similar to pytorch so there's there's a very simple transformation that happens there then there's a graph compiler that works on this along with kernel libraries and and then there's a kernel compiler underneath that all of this uh, in in addition uh, there's a there's a runtime that then is used so essentially you get a model that then gets compiled by the compiler you generate a, an executable at the bottom. That's what you see here with a PEF. A PEF is an executable in this case. The Samba runtime will then manipulate the, the PEF so that it can be run uh, either on an RDU or a CPU as you want, right? Uh, in, in our case, in most cases, you want to actually run it on an RDU. Um, 
So uh, that's that's the overall architecture. A lot of the stuff, uh, a lot of the operations that you see and a lot of the architecture details that you see are essentially driven by the fact that the compiler has the uh, means to figure out the various complex interactions between the different parts of a model. And essentially what it can do is it can take these data flow graphs and it can, you know, most of these data flow graphs, uh, so the one that's shown here, for example, um, it has, uh, they can often have very messy communication pattern if you assume all to all. But in many cases, what happens is the compiler, because it knows exactly uh, what operations feed into what, uh, can then uh, simplify the, uh, through the compilation, can simplify the communication pattern that, ha that, uh, that happens. And, and so that's what the job of the compiler is, basically take the models at a high level, uh, reduce it down to an executable, and then put that executable on the chip. So that's what we will see. There are two ways of looking at this, um, uh, just to give you a, a more concrete example of this. Uh, again, going back to the old examples of softmax and layer norm, um, let's just walk through this. So in the case of softmax, it's a relatively easier operation. There are three uh, compute operations here. There's the uh, X, there's the addition, and then there's uh, the reduce operation, and then uh, there's the division. So uh, the summation operations, I should say. Um, so when, when you look at that, uh, the compiler will then uh, uh, start allocating into the PMUs. It will start allocating the, the X and the M and the R and the O memory uh, uh, arrays them, tensors themselves, right? So um, uh, that's what gets populated here. That's what you see here in the X and the M's and the O's and the R's. And then the uh, orange units are essentially the compute units. So that gets then uh, put on the compute unit, right? So uh, the compiler has, has a, in this particular case, has an easy, easy job of doing an easy mapping. Let's do a slightly more complicated example where you're taking something like a layer norm, right? A little bit more, in um, uh, complex than, than the previous one. Uh, there are several different types of operators here and you can see a similar mapping here as well. Now, the compiler can now go ahead and say, you know, there are other parts of this uh, application that I also need to put on, the, on, um, on this particular tile or on this particular chip. And so I cannot dedicate quite as much uh, of the real estate to uh, just this one operation. So it can then choose to use the same units down there and do things like kernel fusion, for example, right? You can fuse certain operators and it can pipeline certain other operators and then um, get sir, put this in, in a smaller amount of space, both in, in both in terms of compute as well as well as a memory. Use fewer units. It, it will take long, a little longer uh, when you do that, but um, it's better utilization of resources. Now, in, in case there is even more of a crunch, it can actually go and do this to the next level, which is now it can make a trade-off between time and space. That is, it's going to say, I'm only going to use two compute units and let the operation cycle through that. Uh, and I'm going to use three uh, memory units so that um, uh, the results can be held and, and the weights and parameters and the inputs can be put. But that's all I'm going to use. Of course, it's going to take a little longer than the uh, previous case, previous two cases you saw, but you would be using fewer, uh, uh, you'd be using fewer resources as part of doing this. Essentially giving the compiler the flexibility to uh, flexibly uh, use the resources any way they want, right? That is, uh, it'll figure out based on how, the number of units that are available, the, the number of units it needs, how, how to best fit that. So all of this is under the purview of the compiler. And so the compiler essentially takes, you know, operationally what it does is it basically takes a convolution graph like this, it'll compile it down and, and it'll figure out how many PC, how many units it needs. And then it essentially lays out the entire uh, uh, executable across the chip. Okay, so here what you see is that that and that convolution graph has been compiled down, and it has been laid out on the chip. Where now the convolution operation takes certain number of PCUs and PMUs. The next operation pool takes a certain number. Similarly, with the next convolution after that, and not the norm and the sum. And so this forms a sort of data flow kind of topology across the the entire. Uh, um, RDU itself, right? Keeps it very efficient because as I mentioned before, you can do both pi uh, uh, pipelining here as well as you can get parallel. You can exploit all the parallelism that you want. So you can, you can make the trade-offs that you need in order to uh, get to the uh, um, 
the resource fit that a compiler needs. So the smarts of all of this are in the compiler. The smarts of all of this are actually in software. Right, or it's the it's the software that makes the the trade offs. What it essentially also means is because the the compiler can do that, it's no longer the programmer's responsibility to have to do any of the fusion or have to do in you know, a how do I fuse these two kernels so I can take best advantage of all the resources. No, no, don't worry about that. The compiler will just deal with how to get the best performance and the best resource utilization out of this. Right, so that's that's the job. So. Um, Another example that might actually be interesting to look at, so uh, uh, looking at sparse ma uh, matrix multiply here. Uh, when you do this, uh, as we know, sparse uh, matrices are uh, represented in a CSR-like or a Yale-like representation, where you take a two-dimensional matrix and essentially convert that into three matrices that are uh, uh, linear, single-dimensional matrices, right? So uh, that, that's what you see here. So instead, in, in the normal case, and in, in the traditional case, what you do is you take this operation and you would build your own fused kernel around it, right? So you'd need to specialize it for this kind of operation, you need to specialize it for the kind for the dimension of the vector that you have, all of the uh, tensor that you have, and all of that, right? Uh, in in the case of uh, RDUs, you don't need to worry about any of that, right? The R, uh, what we do is we take a, sp a spatial approach to this, and and essentially you can take those operations and you can convert them into a flow of the very simple pattern like operations that you the, that we mentioned before right so here you will see that same data flow like topology where instead of having to write your own kernel now the compiler looks at it and says okay i'm doing it, going to do index index selections uh, which is basically a gather operation right and then we, you follow that with with multiply you follow that with an accumulate and and these are all standard patterns these are all standard operations that it uh, knows how to layout on the chip. So you can get the best uh, um, performance out of that. And, and we've used this in, in the case of LLM training, for example. We've, we have this one uh, uh, blog where we talk about how with the sparse matrices, you can get 3x the performance that you could uh, otherwise get right by, by doing transformations like this. So there can be significant gain when you, when you take an approach like this. And what's more, the compiler is doing all of it by itself. You don't need to worry about it. You don't need as, as a programmer, you don't need to write those kernels yourself, okay? Um, hey, VJ. Yeah. Just give me a time check. You got about five minutes, I think. So okay. uh, you might wanna if um, uh, keep, keep, a, keep a moment for questions, so. Yeah, sure. So, so let me quickly just go through a, a couple of things here and, and I'll, I'll, I'll stop, right? So the data flow architecture is, um, uh, very useful as long as you can do a good balance between data flow efficiencies between compute and very large memory capacity. So we actually bring very large memory capacity to these systems. You can have up to eight terabytes on uh, per application. So if, if you look at that and if you compare that with a single GPU, you get like about 100x uh, the capacity that you get out of a single GPU. So a single model can have access to a very large amount of data. As I mentioned previously, you can do things like multi-tenancy in this, you can mix your workloads, uh, or you can just use all eight RDUs uh, in, in a single application if you want, right? So the, these can be used in, in many different ways. Um, the inst instance of this where we put this in a, in, in a server-like box and then we rack it up and uh, deliver servers is what we call data scale. Uh, each of those uh, server units is an uh, is an eight uh, eight accelerator node unit with eight terabytes, uh, where you can run uh, any combination of applications, either a single application or multiple applications in there. Okay, so I'll I'll kind of stop here. I do have a single slide that kind of shows you what that system looks like individually. Each of the nodes looks like, but um, I'll I'll pause here and and see if there are any questions. Um, Anything that uh, folks uh, might want to ask or that I can help clarify on? If anyone has questions, like, uh, please feel free to uh, chime in or just you can put your question on the chat window. So, uh, yes, I will be sharing the slides. Yeah, we'll be sh sharing the slides. We you have the recording of this. There are other recordings of, of uh, that explain the architecture as well. So you have access to a lot of other material as well that you can um, independently review. <laughs> 
There's a question on the in the chat window also asking about any benchmarking data that compares the performance per dollar with data center scale GPUs. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, there are various ways of looking at this. We actually have a bunch of our own uh, blogs uh, where we talk about the performance characteristic of each one of them. I'll give you an example. Last uh, um, December, when we when we announced these systems, we talked about training uh, and LLM. So we'll probably uh, go into some of that a little later during the training sessions. Uh, we talked about how we can do that 6x faster than uh, A100. Okay, and and that's just on a node to node basis. Um, if if you uh, understand how the whole system was put together, and if you compare at rack levels or deployment levels, then you can actually get uh, an an even better um, in, uh, uh, gain efficiency gain out of it uh, of more of the order of eight x rather than just six x. But yeah, we have that. Plus, we have individual um, numbers that we have against uh, other benchmarks as well. Um, today, our primary focus um, is uh, with uh, on, on the AI for science or HPC side with um, with folks like you, with, with uh, uh, our uh, ANL and others who are using it in, in more of a data scale type. But uh, on the commercial side, uh, we also um, our, our primary focus is is on delivering foundational models and and we have other benchmarks there that we talk about as well. So depending on on what your oh besides that, there are actually other numbers that folks from within DOE have actually talked about that might be more relevant to the kind of work that you're doing. And there are several instances within DOE where um, uh, they've noted that they've gotten 5x uh, improvement uh, across um, uh, over GPUs, right? So uh, there are a number of those. So you can just go to samanova.ai uh, and, and take a look around there, and you might be able to get um, some idea of uh, what kind of uh, things we have tried out or you know, what kind of things we have reported there.